Hi. I, we, we start right right on time. Hi, everyone. So uh, welcome to the today's kind of second session uh, artist talk with with Richard uh, Sodden Smith, um, who I will introduce in a second. Uh, Rich is going to speak for about half an hour. Then Peter. Rayberg and I will just ask a few questions as a starter and then open to, to the rest of you, to, to the audience. So Richard Stodden Smith is professor of photography and in of arts and media at uh, Norwich University of the Arts in the UK. And his work is published and exhibited extensively nationally and internationally. He's on the editorial advisory yeah, no, panel. I do, I, do, I do get it. I do get it because it's... Clarissa, you are not muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> As I was saying, his work is published <laughs> and exhibited <laughs> extensively nationally and internationally and on the board, uh, on the editorial advisory panel of the journal of uh, photography and culture. He's a patron of the Norwich Film Festival and a trustee of the Council for Higher Education in Art and Design. A former board member of Book Room Press and the editorial advisory board of Master TV. He's also co-editor of uh, Langford's Basic Photography and the book is alive. Richard first came to um, international notoriety when his full uh, frontal photograph of the ex-boyfriend Simon who had uh, an AIDS uh, diagnosis, won the National Portrait um, Gallery Photographic Portrait Award in 1997. But the media sponsors, the time, the Times on Saturday, refused to publish the image as the editor deemed it too disturbing for a family newspaper. The image and issues of censorship became a new story uh, published around the world. In fact, an entire uh, letters page in the UK amateur photographer magazine of readers' comments was devoted to his photograph, all uh, negative comments. This led Richard to later publish the chapter Exiles of Normality, Photography and the Representation of Diseased Bodies in the book Cultures of Exile, Images of Dis Displacement from 2004 as a way of responding to that criticism. Also, uh, as a way of response, Richard having his own uh, AIDS diagnosis, put himself center stage in his work, using his body to explore and challenge stigma and misconceptions of living with HIV. A summary of that practice, the chapter listening to myself, AIDS representational, uh, representation of personal perspective can be found in the book, HIV in World Cultures, Three Decades of Representations from 2013. His recent photographic work in part explores the unknown of the future, having survived so long, reflecting on the journey from twink to daddy, um, from one pandemic to, I was just gonna say, this is like a familiar story, but no, I've never been a twink. Uh, from twink to daddy, from one pandemic to another, the multiple roles played and the new roles yet to be discovered. His talk today is entitled Mask for Masks, uh, a reflection of a daddy, Reflections of a Daddy on Surviving a Pandemic. Uh, so without further ado, Richard, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for that introduction, Charles. Um, I will start to share my screen. Um, in, in terms of, um, hopefully we can, see that, not give too much away at the start. So hopefully that's full screen now. Yeah, that's fine. Lovely, thank you. Um, partly in the spirit of the way the project I really want to talk about um, was made, which, which really is kind of, kind of improvised. Um, and it's all about being playful and not knowing what I'm doing, is I'm going to deliver this talk in the same way and not know what I'm doing. Um, so what I've done is, is I've, I've created a presentation with hundreds of, of images, and I'm going to kind of respond to those as I go through. 
Um, but the key thing at the start here in terms of the title is reflection. So when I was thinking about putting the presentation together, um, the, the work is a reflection. And I just thought what I wanted to do was try and give a very quick overview of the various projects that led to the work that I really wanted to talk about today, the kind of un unknowing X project. Um, but in that introduction, um, this is the image that Joel's talking about. This one, the John Cabell, um, now called the Taylor Wessing Prize the National Portrait Gallery, um, an image of Simon, my ex-boyfriend. Um, and we were saying that this became quite controversial. The Times didn't want to publish it, but a lot of other people did. And actually, some of those comments in the Amateur Photographer magazine were, were generally homophobic, they were misogynistic. They were all from men, and nearly all the men lived in the north of England. I don't know why, but that's where the letters came from. Um, and, you know, they talked about um, the, the picture only won because the competition jury were pandering to the AIDS lobby, or the powerful AIDS lobby, which I didn't know existed in 1997, but apparently there was one. Um, and one comment was that they didn't see any, they didn't think the male nude was an appropriate photographic subject, unlike the female nude, which is a photographic subject, but not photographing men. Um, and also there was a comment from an amateur photographer that happened to be a doctor who said that he just saw this as a clinical photographic images with no artistic merit whatsoever. Um, and, and actually it did come from these reference points of you know, kind of ethnographic and, and early pseudoscientific studies of the body. And so saying that got published in a number of journals and books. Um, so it got widely distributed around the world and became quite a debate. And so then there was this point about actually throwing myself really into, uh, into the work. I'd always used myself as, as, a, as a kind of model on and off for, for a long time. And I decided to create a body of work about living with HIV under the title, The Damaged Narcissist. And so I quickly realized I was creating personas for myself. And so this sense of already, like when I was looking at the work, I didn't want to call them self portraits. I wanted to kind of have a bit of distance as a third person looking back at the work and be objective about it. And that I should be kind of universal in these pictures. So it was very much around Actually, I realized I was already kind of um, role playing. And the PowerPoint. Ooh. Sorry, the PowerPoint seemed to be sticking. And Joe Spence was an early influence on this work. Um, those that don't know her, again, a photographer, there's maybe, the, you know, a feminist photographer dealing with image of women, of particularly working class women, um, of breaking down the male gaze. But at the same time, she had a diagnosis of breast cancer and did a lot of work about that as a kind of patient's perspective. And my work, listening to myself, was a line that came from some of her text. And she was very much into a kind of holistic view and kind of, in, especially in a way, taking power back as a patient from the institutions and the doctors. And so that led to a lot of work, again, kind of dressing up, dressing up as being the doctor and playing around with subverting the idea of the kind of uh, perhaps authority in the image and uh, the relationship between the individual and the institution and centre staging my body as, as somebody that was HIV positive within this. And so this idea of kind of say like, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, about uh, always a sense of kind of perhaps not having a voice within this system and, and perhaps being invisible. But this idea of kind of face coverings, of masks, of kind of blindfolds seem to come into the work quite a bit. And I then developed that work and edited it down into a series of posters. And again, these could then be posted on the street. And there's a kind of reference to early AIDS activism and actually putting myself out there on these A1 posters. And again, this sort of work was, was widely published around the world. Um, and again, it's very much this thinking around this HIV body, what that meant to me, 
but what that meant to doctors or what that meant to scientists and this kind of relationship to um, the, the anatomical there, but about how our understanding of our subjectivity was being derived from what we were told by other kind of institutions. And working within that field, then picking up on a kind of safe sex series, self-love, using double exposures, um, you know, this, this fear of contagion and, and connection with people. And so this sense of then, you know, uh, contagion, pandemic, virus, um, kind of informing the work. There was also collaborative projects with other HIV artists, in this case, Albert J. Wynn. And over a period of a couple of years, he came to London. I went to, to his house here in LA, looking over LA was absolutely beautiful. And there's kind of cross-generational discussion uh, to, you know, um, Albert unfortunately died, he's no longer with us. But I think at the time of making these images, he's about the age I am now. There was something like a kind of 15, 16 year difference, um, age difference. And so we were exploring both our, our life experiences, um, you know, cross continents, cross generation, um, and exploring our different bodies and the different ages of our bodies. And again, we just like to do the play up as well. So the play role of who is the doctor, who is the patient. When we look at these people, who, who has the authority, who doesn't, um, and how that's established through these kind of codes and conventions. This then, uh, another piece of work developed around tattooing, and this became the anatomical man. So this was another new persona that I started developing. And it came from response to that repetitive trips, the kind of, in, it, to the clinics to have a regular blood test. And this is like the kind of invasive procedure, um, which then, you know, the use of a needle sticking into the body to draw blood. And so then I had the, the veins and arteries uh, tattooed onto my body um, in kind of making reference to that. And again, kind of making, to a certain extent, there's a kind of reference here to these, these early paintings and this, image of the doctors again picking up that they're all male doctors in the position of of men within this position of knowledge and power and again you know a lot of this work is trying to interrupt disrupt uh, that that kind of um, uh, uh, level of thinking discussion assumptions that goes on then working walking into an exhibition I think it was the skin exhibition at the Wellcome Trust this picture on the on, on the left um, reminded me of this uh, Jeffrey Silverthorne's 1972 pictures in the morgues um, and that became the idea for my next tattoo um, and that's a kind of opening up but then closing of the body where earlier the veins and arteries were making external the internal workings of the body and at this point I commissioned a mask uh, a, a, a face corset from the artist uh, Patrick Ian Hartley. And that became added on to the anatomical man as, a, as the, the muscles and stuff that were uh, stitched into the face mask. And I took these into what actually is a, a teaching hospital. So it, I just thought that was interesting that it's staged in the replica of a hospital that was just used for nurses and doctors for training and not a natural hospital but use that again as a place for, for role play and dressing up and using again those different relationships between uh, the, the body and the clothing and positions that that clothing um, created. And this work was then um, various journal articles and stuff. And again, it's interesting because it's tattoos, it got published in tattoo magazines in lifestyle magazines, etc as well as academic essays. And part of that project, I thought at that point when I had the tattoos, I created that work. This is a point for me to move on from always working and referencing around um, HIV and AIDS. And I collaborated with another artist, Jonathan Moore. We had a photogrammetry uh, set that we went to, it's like 148 cameras for one hundred and twenty-fifth of a second, they all fired at the same time and took an image of my body. 
that created digital images that were then stitched together to create my own avatar. Um, and so this is then can actually be animated. You know, we could put in some games and we can play with it. Um, so there's all sorts of things that could be done with it. We could pre print it out with 3D um, uh, modeling um, and, and create something. Um, and I'm not going to share the video here, but one interesting thing, because it's digital and therefore it's transparent, that we were able to invert the body. And what we did was create a, a film where you traveled inside my body um, and were, were then uh, literally you could go, it, it's empty, but again, because it's inverted, my veins and arteries have then come back on the inside of my body. Um, and we turned that into a VR experience. And so you were able to then put the VR headset on and able to walk inside my body and inside my head and go up and down my body. And when it was installed, we created this image by taking that model, splitting it out and skinning myself. And so my entire skin is hung up um, uh, uh, as a display. And just prior to, or the prelude to the, the project I really came to talk about and what's been happening recently, um, was this, this project called Death of Youth? Um, and I think this is part of where some of it's starting when I reached being 50 and started to think about aging and my body, but also kind of reflecting on some of the younger guys and how they uh, um, related to me, but also how they were using pornography online in dating apps, et cetera, to define what their sexual preferences were. And I felt that they were projecting those onto me to a certain extent. Um, and so I was kind of saying, you know, that often they were articulating their, their desire for me in terms of, of like domination and often calling me daddy. So this is why really in the title, I'm trying to be ironic. I was never using the title daddy. A lot of people don't, I think. But, you know, it, it, it uh, has a means to an end. Um, and, and again, the whole daddy thing for me just becomes a role play. Um, and the same with having, you know, a younger boyfriend at the time, you know, like 32 years younger than me. You know, we had these discussions where he was called a twink and how he was being defined and would never see himself at that and how I was being defined as a daddy and these odd misconceptions and relationships that were happening with that. And so really, I'm going to start the presentation now. <laughs> uh, so that was, that was this kind of precursor of all this work that one has been doing and therefore I was saying reflecting on that. I think also in terms of, you know, that's, you know, I find the title, what well, it's supposed to be kind of ironic. It's, you know, it's not me calling myself daddy, but it's this kind of, you know, persona that's put onto me by other people. Um, and, but also this mask for masks. I think I first came across this on, you know, I don't know how popular it was, but I certainly think I came across it on, Horn, on the Hornet app, where they were promoting it quite heavily. And also it kind of made me think about the kind of safer sex campaigns back in the day and stuff. You know, um, but the, but trying to get the gay community to uh, uh, take up wearing masks and and look after themselves and protect themselves and protect others. And while I was creating this work, I did something for the Visual Aids organisation. So I'm a member of that and have my my work there. And so Visual Aids, there's the Visual Aids archive that houses uh, kind of digital copies of um, artists that are HIV positive or the estates of artists that have died. And we did a, a, a piece, I'll just quickly read this out. They just wanted a kind of one minute text on the theme of viral. So masculinity, masculinity in the age of antiretrovirals, undetectable, a place I have inhabited for years, the X of unknowing, can be a viral kiss from me to you, broken free from contagion. What future now I have survived? Who can I be? An antiretroviral journey, an undetectable life, my virus becomes untransmissible. Unbelievably positive, you remain negative. The virulence of the virus is stigma transmitted online, your profile declines, your mass persona looking for clean. So the, the general name of the project is the unknowing X. 
And it's based around actually having a huge dressing up box from different stages of my life. Um, and created all these kind of binaries there, like from AIDS patient to university professor, from, from gender bender to porn star. And by amassing this, this kind of dressing up box, I'm just reflecting on those past lives off and, and then kind of trying to create something in the future, thinking if there are new roles, new potential roles, you know, that when the doctors tell you now that your all your 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 statistics are normal, you have a normal life expectancy. Something I didn't expect, having been um, uh, diagnosed in 1994, and suddenly looking as I'm about to reach 60 on what this means for the future. And so there's all these kind of complex relationships between different real personas, but also these online profiles that one inhabits, and the use of role play to subvert categorization expectations of these labels such as daddy and son, sub dom, butch femme, in a demonstration of the fluidity of masculinities. And if I was to make a bold claim, representations exploring or exploring representations of what Professor John Mercer called saturated masculinity, overburden and often conflicting. But this work is very much about play, about just about living, about having fun. But actually, through the process of not knowing what I was going to do, just going to the studio, just dressing up, then it's become this kind of reflection and, and, and kind of psycho analyzing myself in terms of where all these things have come from. And at the same time, doing this work, you know, that then the COVID pandemic happened. Um, we had to go on lockdown, and luckily, the studio was here in this house, and I was able to carry on. But all these influences came around from what was happening. Um, and, and, you know, that, that COVID pandemic happening, you know, th th there was this kind of, again, reflection happening, both kind of haunted by previous lives lived and lives lost and remembering those that, that have lost. And now witnessing a new language of superheroes not afforded to us in the past. And so in that list, I was saying, you know, it, I kind of created these binaries of, of literally different parts of my life. Um, go, go, dancer to boxer, drag queen to leather queen, twink to daddy, um, and everything in between. And actually what I'm saying these, you know, when you look back on your life, you had these separate, well, almost feels like separated out parts of your life, which all converge, they're all fluid, they all overlap. And so, you know, here's my, my family album. We've all got family albums like this, I guess. Um, visualizing of those different roles that I had, that we can see from twink and gender bender to go go dancer to drag queen to professor, taking up boxing later in my life to to daddy. Um, but this idea of the dressing up box started what here in 1970, age seven. Um, that's me getting married. The the red dress is actually my mother's wedding dress, but she had it dyed red after the wedding so she could go out jiving in it. Um, and that's my older brother marrying me to my younger brother with our neighbours as witness. And so we had this dressing up box as kids, so maybe that's where really all of this started. But I think the first series of images about dressing up started to refer immediately back to those images I've just shown around kind of playing with, with the roles of dressing up as a, a doctor or a patient. And part of it was inspired by seeing this Ken Curry exhibition and these amazing images of his. And so it kind of informs these subverting this kind of doctor surgeon outfit, sex, sexing it all up a little bit, what's under these, these uh, um, uniforms that they are wearing. So there's a whole range of kind of just messing around with that. But again, it's this idea of thinking about the individual and the institution, uh, who, what these different bodies are, but again, kind of disrupting the authority. So, you know, uh, I shouldn't say really, but these, these are my, my dean's gowns. This is what I was just wearing in graduation last week to see all the students across the stage. And then uh, kind of subverting that role of uh, the institutional position one has. So who is this daddy in all this that we're doing? I mean, this was another part that kind of flipped the, the work I was doing. I was shooting it in, in, in colour and I swapped it to black and white 
and suddenly it seemed, yeah, I just, all, all these different kind of influences came to my mind about, particularly, you know, there's a certain thing turning into black and white about these kind of, these pictures made at home against the curtains of, you know, these kind of 50s physique pictorial images. Um, but, but people like Pierre Monnier, where, which is the closest most people kind of talk about the work, but Claude Calhoun, all these other kind of less known, but really kind of private images that people have made like Soro, who dressed up with these weird kind of fetishes. Um, but there's also Polly Borland and other people who was, did a series called Makeup of Dressing Up. There's amazing work of, of Matthias Herman and all his work that he's done showing his body through the ages as well. Um, as well as you know, people like Sonali and, and Samuel who are using the studio, doing self-portraiture, who are dressing up who are creating these different personas and images. So that then started to inflect on the work and what I was doing. Um, and, whoops, just, something just popped up on screen the way it does. Um, and so again, that kind of, whether it's the kind of the, the muscle, uh, the muscle Mary, the mask, the physique images, um, or creating the kind of dandy daddy, now that my hair has grown during lockdown, I've not had it cut and, um, uh, you know, creating a kind of completely different persona or the redneck daddy, you know, or the disco daddy. Um, and then I started to play around with all these on my profiles. So the various dating apps one might have um, and, um, you know, it, it's a kind of fun thing seeing the responses people might have to these different images. Um, and, and that's been interesting in its own right in terms of, um, of, of the, the kind of comments one might get uh, from around the world of doing things like that. But again, you know, what is this persona of the daddy? You know, is he supposed to be dominant? Is he supposed to be muscular? Is he supposed to be butch? Is he even supposed to be old? You know, even the... the my boyfriend uh, that, you know, he said that you know, he was with some guys in his early twenties and the guy called him daddy. You know, it seems to now become a description of, of who is gonna be the top, who's gonna to be dominant rather than necessarily something to do with age. But there seemed to be something particular in like how you describe that figure. Um, and again, therefore, one was wanting to play with what that meant. And again, if the daddy is dominant, uh, uh, you know, it's worth putting in a few ass shots as well to subvert that, I think. Um, and just extending that just in terms of um, those, those different outfits, breaking it all up, creating all these different kind of personas of who this person might be in this kind of role play. And that, you know, that, that notion of the, the daddy being butch, I guess. I think I've always been interested in the notion of butch, uh, particularly in, in um, images that, that seen from, um, you know, in, in relationship to a kind of book fe butch femme and a lot of lesbian photography. Um, but again, that allows for even more kind of personas to play, play up to in terms of, of butch. Um, but noting that crown there in terms of butch, um, this was also a reflection on um, the, the, the local drag scene. And one of the interesting things about that was that when I came to Norwich, there's an amazing drag scene and there was a uh, house of days who had their club. And when I first walked into that club, I was just overwhelmed with, with the kind of love that was there. And it was very much around a kind of non-gendered, non-binary space where everybody was welcome. And they did their own Vogue ball. And within that Vogue ball, there was the catwalk, you know, the, the category is butch. And my friends kind of got me to enter that and I won. And that's what that little crown is. That was my winning crown from being uh, at the Vogue ball and winning the category is butch. But also it was kind of interesting because we were in this, non-gendered space, non-binary space. Um, and it, it was like, I got the crown because I was the most recognizable, traditional, masculine, butch persona that was there. Um, and 
I just thought within even within that environment that was interesting um, that that it came back down to what that traditional representation of of um, butch and masculine should be, and so again it was playing with the physique, with the sports, um, with with going to the gym and the weightlifting, weightlifting, just kind of interrupting all that kind of stuff that went on. And I don't know if anybody, if any of you are, are in London, uh, have been in London, were able to get along to see the, the Rebel Dykes exhibition, wonder, wonderful exhibition that just finished, unfortunately, on, on uh, fr last Friday, I think. Uh, and I've got that picture there because that was uh, Sadie Lee's painting, Venus Envy, again, that comes from about 1994. And, and when I was playing in this dressing up box, I was, this image came to mind. I didn't realize it, it was so old. And I thought, well, I've got the suit like that. And kind of recreated those images that were that, that, that recreated the painting. But also, I used to go to the drag king um, clubs, um, and I remember my friend artist Del La Grace Volcano. Um, they saying to me, "Oh, I was dressed in the same suit," and they were just saying, "Oh, you get it, you know, you get it. What it is about this kind of dress up and role play and performing masculinity." Um, and was like, you could be an honorary drag king. So I've always worn that with, with pride as well. Um, but also it's that sense of just whenever you get up in the morning, um, you know, one is putting on drag. Um, and I did that very early on in terms of going into management. I put on my suit. I put on my suit to be the dean and so that I have my dean's drag. Um, and it's just like, that's what you do. You pick up your clothes in the morning, put them on, and that's drag. Um, and I just wanted to carry that kind of, you know, persona through and those thoughts through with whatever I was doing. Um, and so then, you know, again, it's like this work was happening. Um, you know, I was saying this kind of mask for mask seemed to be something that was trending on 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 Hornet. Um, but there was this other kind of section of work. Um, that, that was started to be informed really by all these weird masks I had. I collected all these Mexican wrestling masks when I was at an AIDS conference in Mexico City, which was a kind of reference there. But even in these images, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing the, the paint overalls for my DIY while I was painting this house. Um, and then it was creating all these different new masks um, that we were told that we had to wear a mask. Um, and again, all these different kind of dressing up and personas were coming back into the picture. And again, double exposures, um, creating these images of self-love, you know, lockdown in lockdown, um, not being able to communicate and talk to people in, in you know, physically in the open. Um, And then these kind of images extending to these images of, of self-love, having these kind of the, the masks. And also there's this, the, you know, the, the each kind of, the, there's this whole massive work that comes under this persona of the unknown X. And there's all these kind of odd little discrete projects, but literally, um, I may think of a few ideas that I want to do, but I would go into the studio, have all these different clothes and wigs and, and outfits around the room, and then just start picking up different things to dress up in. And so each time I go into the studio, it's just exploring different kind of personas that might be there. But, the, but these ones are kind of entitled the, the death of disco. And it was just like, um, really wanted to go out and, uh, you know, it's locked down and we can't go out and party, we can't go out and disco. So I'm gonna do it in the studio and I'm gonna get my hot pants back on again. And I'm gonna be 58 dancing around in my hot pants. But it was this, this kind of, you know, what death of disco again, there, there was something in my mind around closing of the bathhouses in the pandemic in the eighties, you know, not going out, not touching, fearful of contagion and the virus and stuff. Um, and so then the series became yeah, just that, that reflection both on 
the current lockdown, or you know, what we've just gone through in terms of not being able to go night clubbing, well, also what was happening to particularly, you know, I'm just thinking the gazing uh, in my youth as a twink in the 80s uh, and, and going back that way. Also, it was kind of Halloween at the time. Um, and, um, you know, the, the people started giving me props. The, 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 the wedding dress was, was uh, belongs to my lodger, who's a trans woman, who gave me this to play with and just have this son around playing around with uh, uh, um, gender and stuff. But I think like, you know, any good catwalk, you always finish on the wedding dress. And obviously making reference right back to that picture from 1970 of me in my mother's red wedding dress, um, that that's a good place to finish um, at the end of the catwalk, uh, walking down with our wedding, wedding dress on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. That was... Um... I, I was trying a really, a, a really uh, amazing tour of of, uh, of your work. Um, if you could, maybe, yep. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we'll we'll have a few questions for you before we open to to the 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 rest of the the audience. Peter, do you want to? Go first. I think that <laughs> I think that's what we agreed upon, right? So we, we yeah, already well, do I have. A, <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it. So we do have a few questions in the chat already, and we'll come to them later. But uh, Joao and I will um, bring up a few points uh, to to get the thing started. And I want to start with a question, uh, Richard. And thanks again, also from my side. I'm, I'm, you know, I took so many notes and got so many new ideas just listening to you and showing showing your work. Um, I want to come back to your maybe we start with your earlier work uh, where you yourself um, are the model of your of your work. For example, in the series, the damaged narcissist. And what I'm interested in, if we go back to the 1980s, we could say. There are maybe two um, visual paradigms for the representation of the gay male body in the context of HIV AIDS. So on the one hand, we have the spectacle of the suffering body. It's not a desired body anymore. It's, it's a, a body which is kind of beyond sexuality in a certain sense. And on the other hand, we have, of course, um, the reaction by the porn industry, by the gay porn industry, to completely um, repress that uh, the, the damaged body, right, and to give us the uh, a certain kind of. A lot of people have written about this, including John. Uh, you know, the fit body, the healthy body, and and porn becomes almost like a sports uh, exercise of some sorts. Now, with your work uh, from around 2000, it it's a different position because you very clearly um, signify the context of HIV AIDS, uh, though more, I would maybe say symbolically, while at the same time representing a, uh, a body that has no marks of an infection, but a very, you know, a, desir a desirable body. And so I was wondering um, whether that uh, particular decision, I mean, it's, it's an, it's an autobiographical uh, project, I get that. So, you know, it's your body. So, but, you know, I, I, I suppose at the same time, there is a decision of putting that type of body in the context of HIV AIDS. So I was just curious, uh, you see a relation to these earlier positions? Is your work some sort of, re uh, of a response to these earlier positions? Or why this choice of body politics, say, in the context of HIV AIDS? No, absolutely, and thank you, Peter. Because uh, uh, that I think at the start, we were saying <clears throat> that that uh, I had meant to pick up on some of that in the presentation, and as I was just saying, I was just going to you know free fall through this presentation, and I didn't really refer to my notes, so or you know, um, and uh, th that's certainly it. I was thinking a lot around some of those representations that 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 kind of uh, you know super hyped up idealized body. The, the, pornography body where in the 80s when I was thinking about that in the work that you know that um, any kind of 
advert for any, say, gay club or, or, or just anything in the gay newspapers would be, come, would be with a muscled, very fit, very healthy looking person. And there were some kind of adverts that were, that were saying, you know, that were, were using that to then say, you don't know who's got HIV just because they look fit. You don't know, you know, that their health status and whether they've got the virus or not. And so that, that had always played on my mind. And I think that there's a kind of position that, you know, that, that for me, one of the things was that I was HIV positive. I did start to get some of these marks a bit later on in, in 2005, and they do appear because I, I had, you know, carp carposis sarcoma, I had KS and the purple lesions on my body. And that's when, <clears throat> 2005, I started taking the medication. Um, so th there are discrete ones that do appear, um, but it, it, it was this, this thing that I was there living with HIV and yet I had this body that didn't show it, that didn't recognise it, and that there was a wide spectrum of people that were HIV positive, mm -hmm. and, that, um, uh, and because it's autobiographical, it's showing me in that that situation and I think again part of that is probably just, you know was there's, there's an element of, of you know of so much stigma and neg neg uh, negativity and people backing off and people finding out that you're HIV positive and then you know block you drop you the rest of it and and part of it is trying to you know put this body in their faces and say this mm -hmm. is a HIV body what you know what is it that you're rejecting you know mm -hmm. so I think yeah that that was part of what I was um th that was was in in implicit in, in the work at that stage mm -hmm. yeah makes makes a lot of sense thank you Joe you want to go next yeah um actually following following from from this idea uh you know the visibility and and potentially the kind of the contemporary invisibility of, of uh, HIV positive um, bodies. I and because you were, you especially early on, you were really interested in 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 the kind of technologies of the very same um, medical complex that you you were engaging with, and that was engaging with 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 you. And a lot of those, a lot of those technologies are in 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 the, the the clinical setting. Are many of them are kind of imaging technologies as well, right? Uh, they are, you know, X rays. They are various kinds of scans. They are things that are kind of probing um, the body. I mean, they, they are cameras in in some kind of broad sense, right? Technologies of kind of looking in and seeking for something in in the body seeking some kind of truth. And it's kind of interesting that a lot, your work seems to be, have that same kind of forensic approach. You're kind of probing in and like trying to, to find something or trying to find all these different things more, kind of later on with this kind of more, you know, um, experiments in, in, you know, drug, like, like you were talking about. Um, and so you were talking a lot about power as well in the power of medical institutions. And, and, and I was wondering if you could maybe speak a bit to that, to your, you know, the power of yourself as a photographer, you know, the power of you being behind the camera and to actually this, this similarity between you behind the camera and the doctor um, behind all different kinds of other uh, imaging technologies looking back at you so there seems to be kind of a resonance between the photographer and and the doctor that I feel is quite interesting and obviously the camera and the x-ray yeah. machine and whatever kind of tools of power um I wonder if you could like speak to that a bit you know the, how how does that play I mean there's uh, there's uh, so much in that <laughs> uh, and you know, I, I just wanted to pick up on, on, on part of that, that this, this continuous use of devices to explore the body in different ways and to record it, film it, photograph it. Um, 
it is an amazing article that again came from about 94 by, by, um, by Lippert in, in the artist newspaper, which was talking around X-ray machines. But it was about this, this notion of a constant search for a kind of essence of the body. And I recognize that in my work. And then what this article was saying that that's futile, you know, and I think I recognize that in my work uh, at, at the same time. And it was the essence of the body, but also about trying to make sense of HIV, trying to make sense of an invisible virus that's in your body. And that was felt perhaps more difficult to make sense of when you were healthy, when, you know, what Peter was saying, well, there's this body that's not shown the signs of this. So everything is, is hidden. You know, I can't see the virus unless you could pull out the blood and, you know, do the blood test and get the microscope and say, look, there it is. Um, and so I think it, 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 it becomes just that repetition of really just keep searching and searching and searching, searching for a kind of, you know, some way of answer or living with HIV, searching for some kind of essence of what this means, but at the same time being able to kind of step back and kind of understand that um, it's, you know, it's an onion. You peel one, one layer and there's another layer. You peel another layer and there's another layer. And we keep on thinking each layer that we peel away is going to be more significant. And, and it's not, you know. Um, so there was that kind of element, that kind of rotation that, that goes on there. And I think that relationship that started developing with kind of, you know, doctors and that kind of role play, there is something there, I suppose, just in terms of it's kind of Foucauldian in a kind of power knowledge relationship. And again, it's partly looking for the discrepancies that to resist this power in some way. Um, and that I felt that there was one way of describing the work I do was actually about institutions. You know, you could, you could use that term because it was very much about how an individual can, you know, have their own identity within these systems and within these institutions that um, the, the, the kind of overloading of terms like victims, but off even just being a patient, is amazing how much kind of power that or, or, or that you just give over trust whatever to the doctor and in this case particularly with, with HIV and you think of the early days when nobody really knew much about it um, perhaps you could say the same about COVID now that that when we look at the the, the, um, the, the people the gay community, people with HIV, were doing as much research in this area as the doctors were. They're perhaps as informed, you know, um, and that, that that dynamic between, in a way, the public and the institution and the doctor changed, um, I think, through that kind of process. Um, and again, I think that, that therefore is then what's installed in my work about changing those dynamics in terms of, do I just trust this person? Do I trust this person to stick needles into me? Do I trust this person to give me experimental drugs? You know, um, and, and where is my autonomy in this? And so it's that sense of identity and autonomy within this, this kind of institutionalized setting. And within that setting, we've got these figures that are apparently the ones that have the power or authority or the ones we're supposed to listen to. So by continually kind of thinking, well, if this, that an unequal relationship or can I create that an equal relationship or at least trying to create an equal in my photographs in terms of how I'm de depicting me and role playing through that to give them a, a sense of aut autonomy uh, within that situation where you might feel powerless and and, and and I think one of the things I was going to say about that you know the, the or whether I did say it about Jay Spence was that the work that she did with um, uh, with Rosie on that um, was was um, you know it became known as phototherapy, you know, and it was role play, and it was you know you might be reliving a trauma through you know photographic role play and recording that, 
And again, I think that's what strong, very kind of strongly then developed into my own practice. And I don't call it phototherapy, but I think there's an element of that, of that kind of role play that comes out of that kind of practice. Yeah, there's certainly, I mean, I'll, I'll pass, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to, to Peter there. There's, I mean, there's certainly this, this level of, of, of taking on almost like the master's tools as in, as in uh, the tools of, of, of uh, power through through looking and and just trying to take it re reclaim them and and have some kind of, of 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 control over it peter yeah i'm i'm trying to construct a bridge to um the second part of your of your talk and your more recent work and you know maybe take up that distinction you know simplistic distinction between earlier and later work but maybe it does make sense also in the way that what, uh, what happened between your earlier work and your later work is, of course, the de-dramatization of HIV and AIDS um, through treatment as prevention and Truvada and, uh, around 2010. And I think Joao's and mine work, for example, uh, are both in some ways uh, explorations of masculinities and sexualities post-AIDS in a certain uh, way, in very different way with uh, pick uh, sexualities and masculinities or hipster mas masculinities. So I was, I'm trying to um, understand how your response to this post AIDS moment looks like or what it consists of. And I mean, I, I, um, it has something to do with, with role playing, I think, right? So there is role playing has been, has been a topic in your work um, all along, also with the earlier pictures. But there's a very strong interest now in role playing and masculinity as a mask. So perhaps also a, another kind of playfulness than in the earlier pictures. These are just my vague guesses, you know, the direction in which your work is moving. But I'm curious whether you yourself have um, um, how you position your later work uh, in relation to the earlier work, but also specifically in relation to the development of HIV AIDS and, and uh, medical possibilities and the cultures and, and masculinities that grew out of it. I mean, it, it's, it, I mean, it's just really interesting area that, um, at, cause at, at various stages of this work, it's always moving on to explore broader issues, wider issues, or different issues. Um, and yet, every time I do a piece of work, it seems to get related back to HIV. And when I started working with Jonathan Armour on this collaboration, we're creating this film and this VR, you know, it starts off with a point of collaboration about this body, this 50 something body that is tattooed and the, the conversation with Jonathan and the collaboration is very much about picking up on the, on the story, the narrative of, you know, the individual that he works with and their story. And of course, all this stuff kind of comes out. But that work was then presented as here's a VR experience where you can work, walk inside a HIV positive person, but somebody who is undetectable. And we kind of situated in a, situ in a place of saying, well, this person's HIV, they've got the virus, but it's safe for you to be inside them uh, because, you know, you're not going to catch it. And actually you could physically literally be inside them, you know, and he was trying to break down barriers like that. And when I moved on to doing this kind of unknowing X project, you know, th this element about just dressing up and seeing what happens and and playing these different personas and obviously this thing about age was there um and but you know it's that element of of creating some of the work um and and then you know <laughs> see the pictures on the screen print them out and the, the reflection that happens and and again it was like oh my god i'm starting to talk about you know as I mentioned, me getting older, me having survived, me still being here, me thinking, bloody hell, I'm 58, I'm going to be 60 soon. 
where does this leave me now, you know? And if, if that is kind of like saying, well, that's post AIDS because we're in that situation where a normal life expectancy, at the same time, the, the, it's like a trauma, you know? And, and that's one way I think I have to describe it. It's a trauma that, that will never leave me. And so, you know, it, for me, it's, it's almost like it's not post AIDS. It's, it's some, you know, there is no cure. This, what, 32 million people have died of AIDS around the world. It's still here. And, and I'm still HIV positive. Um, and, but that trauma of that experience of my life, is just not gonna leave me. And, and so even trying to create fun, playful work, it, it all seeped back in, into that. Um, but you know, the, at the same time, there was just this this kind of um, I don't know whether now it's like saying, well, if, if that sense of being you know a, a normal life expectancy being undetectable, one was start trying to inhabit the body in a different way, um, and started to seep over into these definitions of of you know this older male, this daddy. Um, I still feel that then I have to have conversations with people, particularly, you know, if it's younger guys that are attracted to this older body because of this kind of role of the daddy or whatever, or, you know, generally don't see age as a, an issue. If, you know, there can still be these like questions like, are you clean? You know, um, I always feel like if you're gonna be kind of dating people who are, you know, who are as old as me, you must be aware of that, their history, what they've gone through to be at this point, or whether you're assuming this person's, well, they're here, they're alive, they haven't, you know, so that they possibly, they, have, they haven't got HIV or AIDS because otherwise they'd be dead. I don't know what's going through their mind, but there's a lack, you know, um, it, it sounds rude, and it's not everybody, but it almost at times just seems a lack of connection with that. Um, so th there's, there's, again, there's always elements where it seeps in um with that um but it's it's this you know i just start playing up on their expectations of this masculinity that i'm supposed to have you know um and and if i can kind of th that's what attracts people there in the first place and then it's kind of breaking that down and 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 breaking down the stereotypes by in a way playing them up in my work I don't know if that answered it because it's like no, you did very kind of complex. I, I, and, and thank you also for um, this this description of the um, you know ongoing trauma. I think is really important because, as we know, HIV/AIDS is not a major topic in gay discourse anymore. You know, or is kind of disappeared in so many ways from from gay culture. So to remind us with your work and. Um, how you describe it right now, the, about the continuity and the the you know the the reality of that history. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's I mean yes, one says it's gone away, but um, when it, there was a a previous paper talk I did, and I mean it's a couple of years ago, but it was using some of these quotes that were on Grinder. You know, I think it was a particular paper for a, a Australian um, researcher academic, but um, but but. You know, it was about these comments that people on Grinder would say to somebody when they found out that they were positive. You know, and we're still, you know, we're 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 talking now. It happens. You know, um, so there's still a you know whatever a lack of knowledge, understanding, just ignorance out there. But that stigma's still there, and 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 it and and if you're if you're online, is that's how you're communicating with people. You know, and and if you're honest, you're, if you're open, you tell people your status and that's the sort of result you get, it's, it, you know, it, it's damaging, it's harmful. So again, it hasn't gone away as such, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as, you were, as you were talking about drug and, and detectability, I couldn't stop like thinking about passing, you know, and it's kind of drug, you know, being also a way of, of passing and the detectability being actually a way of passing uh, in, in some ways because you become kind of unmarked, you kind of blend. Um, and that, that kind of, I, I think that there's this weird, there's this really interesting connection between, between 
the kind of issues of, of undetectability and the kind of the the, the aesthetics of, of drag of trying to to kind of, of of you know pass as a man of putting on your man clothes uh putting on your dean's clothes and and do, do the dean thing uh, but actually what i what you were saying about um this idea of of, of, of survival and and the realizing that you are now older, and it's something that you know, I've I've heard from so many many artists who who survived the, the crisis. You know, I've had this conversation, you know, with with, with Ron Athey. I've had this conversation with, with Matthias Herman, who I was really interested to see. Also, you 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 referring to in your work. And so my question really is, is there are indeed a lot of similarities between at least in terms of, of interest, it seems to me, between, between your work and, and Matthias's work. And, and, and you're also kind of a similar uh, age or generation, and you're also uh, survived uh, AIDS. And so my question, and sorry, Gavin and John, but I'm using my, my uh, chair's privilege. My question is about aging. <laughs> It's about aging, aging as, a, as, as, as someone with HIV, but also more broadly, what, is there a kind of a particular concern that is actually associated with ideas of masculinity, of, of what we expect to be as, as men, uh, what aging does to that? Because we talk a lot about women aging and, and there's all this industry around women and, and age, but I think that's maybe a different way in which it manifests itself in, in, in people who are kind of socialized as men. Uh, but then again, when in these particular instances of actually, of, of, you know, of lifelong trauma, of survival, of, of, of the particular history of, of, of AIDS and gay masculinity. So I just wonder if you, you know, what, where are you with, with thinking about what does it mean to age as a man in your circumstances, <laughs> you know, as an older gay, you know, like it, it comes back to the daddy question as well, you know, like yeah. I've been called a daddy and I'm not even 40 and I, <laughs> I, and I wanted to smack the face of this child, <laughs> you know, uh, so, you know. I, I don't know, it's probably the same as anybody aging. It's, it's another trauma. Uh, I, I mean, there's, there's it, what, what I found interesting on, on the gay scene with, with this, there seem to be various different stages of where you are visible and invisible. And, um, and you know, I, I've certainly, I've had comments from, you know, like, like from students didn't like the critique I gave of their photography work. Who, who said, well, what do you know? You're like 28. And I was like 40 at the time. And I was like, oh, well, I'll take that, you know. Um, but it, it was like that, the, that as a young student couldn't see life beyond 28, you know. Um, all, all these comments is like, if you're over 30 in a nightclub, what are you doing there? You shouldn't be there or something. Um, and I, I like to go out dancing. I like, as I showed in my images, I like to go out nightclubbing still. But it, it almost seemed this phase of being from um, a kind of, you know, this, this kind of younger generation, twink, whatever type thing, to then becoming invisible. Um, and, but then becoming visible again, when one hit a certain sense of maturity um, and, um, and age, and suddenly this, this, then this persona of daddy came along and it's like, oh, well, you know, uh, and, but there seemed, I felt, felt there was a kind of gap in between where one, you know, so that's why I was kind of embracing that role in a way because it made me visible again. Um, but, but it's interesting for me in terms of the, that sense of, you know, still defining what this masculinity is because people, I suppose it's not true of everybody, but somehow, you know, getting older, the, uh, and the way I look, people would perhaps describe me as masculine, you know, or this thing about straight acting or horrible terms like that or something. And, and, and then I have to go fall back to like, well, look at those pictures of me when I was 18 and I was, 
up there and drag on on the stage of heaven doing my shows or whatever you know that's the same person that somebody is responding to now and and people you know are responding to this visual image they see of me of this older man that that seems to purport some kind of maturity but that maturity seems to therefore go hand in hand with some kind of form of masculinity um and and yeah I, you know it's like well it's their perceptions are so different you know to how i feel i am and again you know uh, of this generation of people you know we lived through the 80s you know that's when we grew up that's when you know we were going out there and that that thing of being 18, 19 in, in 1981 and moving to London, you know, it's a sin. You know, that, that you know, that my life that, that was there. Um, you know, we, we both dealt with HIV and AIDS and we went out and partied at the same time. And, and as in my images, I was a gender bender and I played up. And it's one of the things I think, like, I keep like trying to kind of, I don't know, shock the the young kids when they're all off doing their stuff and and uh, getting up and drag and go oh look this is me in 1986 you know there's that it's so unrecognizable for them um and, and so there's weird i recognize this that that i have a certain persona to other people and it purports to be a certain kind of masculinity um, and there are things in my life that I enjoy that do that, that I'm an Arsenal supporter. I used to have a, you know, a, a season ticket to go and watch the games. I enjoy boxing. I took up boxing later in my life to do, you know, um, but at the same time, you know, I, that, you know, I put on a pair of fishnet stockings and jump in the studio. It's, you know, life is just full of contradictions. Um, and some of that, I just try and, you know, I said, get across to the other people that I engage with uh, and just trying to explore all that that broadness of what human life is like you know um, but again I don't know if I'm answering anything I'm, you are you know, indeed it, but it's, it, it's, it reminds me it reminds me that's like the, the trans theorist Andrea Long, Long Chu has this sentence that something along the lines of you know, gender is not something you do it's something others do to you and it, it kind of the daddy thing is not necessarily something one does something others do to you or you know at some point and you have to kind of negotiate it like one does with, with gender and masculinity really peter do you have any oh, i I'm think done. you know what i think it's time to open uh to, to the floor and to have uh others um intervene you agree is that yes yes I think <laughs> okay so. so maybe we will we'll have a quick a look at the chat uh because there have been some questions sitting for more than 40 minutes uh we had a question Richard by, or gavin yeah we had a question by, Rich, by richard which i think is pretty much was covered by your question joao so um i don't know if richard is still here and wants to raise the question but or also like yeah, raise your hand. Come on, if you, if you would like, Richard. Not want to put you on the literal spotlight. It would be good to have other people can I, behind. Can I just uh, talk? Because I live in the country. Yes, you can, and of My course. megabytes is awful. It's three megabytes a second. So, um, <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, yeah, honestly, really good pictures, Richard. I was so sort of moved by the honesty um, with which you know you, you did a talk like this. I mean, it, not everyone who can do. Do a talk like this and, and take pictures of themselves. But um, one of the things I noticed was that there seemed to be, there were no kind of what I call straight nudes. You know, there was sort of technology, there were specific contexts, there were objects, there were environments. And I just kind of wonder to what extent you kind of see your identity or your body as linked with, with kind of non human aspects or sort of objects. Um, or accessories, those sorts of things, they seem to be really important in your picture. So I just wonder whether that extends to your sense of self more generally. I mean, I think that's really interesting because I did see the comment when it came up and I was, and, and, and thank you for your very kind comments about the talk and the work. Um, the, the, um, I said in some ways your question kind of surprised me because I hadn't really thought about that, to be honest. 
Um, and, and, and articulating it in, in that way, this kind of link to objects or, or, or kind of non-human objects, I, I was, my immediate response was like, well, no, you know, I don't see that, you know, I'm all about the body, you know, and, and just fixated about the body. Um, but, 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 but yes, you're right about it in, in situating the body within an environment. And actually, the, the, there were works I was talking about, which was called Man Contemplating His Own Body, um, or uh, his body image with the um, anatomical drawings around it. And, and again, that was shot in my kitchen at home. Those are things that I had at home in terms of just kind of objects and, and, and um, the, the anatomical drawings and stuff. Um, and I, I was thinking very much about the domestic space and how this um, almost imposition of um, the, the institutionalized body or the medicalized body uh, was imposed upon us in terms of thinking about our own subjectivity. And so that, that while we think about this as a kind of institutional scientific language over there somewhere, it, it, it inhabits our day to day, you know, and our, and our domestic. So I thought with some of those, I wanted to situate it within that. And then, like pushing it into, as I'm saying, the 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 fake, the trainee hospital, you know, the replica of the hospital. I just thought that worked so well in terms of that language of what one was doing in the work. Um, and again, because it was at the the old university I used to work at, it was at London South Bank University, but um, it was that element of again training, and it was where you know, lecturers were there passing on their knowledge to the student nurses and stuff. And it was a, a location of knowledge um, and, and authority and power. And so having, a, you know, having that kind of location just worked really well. And, and I, I have done some where I have, if I've been in the hospital and taking pictures within the environment. And again, it's always trying to, in a way, rub myself up against that environment. And, and perhaps, you know, God, that sounds awful, I say, rub myself up against the objects, you know, but, but um, you know, that x-ray machine, you know, ha having the x-rays in my head, touching them, you know, actually touching those x-rays and being tactile and kind of breaking down the, the distinction between the, that ins institutional object or that object of seeing and myself and my body and, and, and it's always about trying to foreground the body in all those situations or against those different objects that are there. So it's, I have to say, I haven't really thought about that before you know, to, to a certain extent, but, you know, but it is about always foregrounding the body to try and create some kind of dialogue between those other elements that are in the picture. Yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> Lots to think about. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. Gavin, do you want to come in? Yeah, um, I can come in, although it's maybe not quite the, the question I posed. Um, <laughs> I mean, I th I'm, I, I'm interested in, um, in hearing a little bit more about sort of representations of, of, of the middle age or the 50 something go gay body and and the exploration of what that body can do because I think the work you know I mean clearly the work is not just about the you know um you know living on with with HIV but it's also about you know aging and, and middle age and I, I, I kind of reflecting on so well yeah I guess how, how does the daddy become undetectable in this process how, how, how are you kind of pushing the boundaries of, of how um the middle-aged gay body is represented. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, again, that's um, interesting um, that, you know, it, what can this body do? Well, I was about to say less and less. <laughs> like, you know, it gets harder and harder, um, you know, and, and more tiring because, you know, I'm running back and forward with a self timer in the studio. It just gets more and more tiring. Um, and God, there's an there's an element of um, 
uh, you know, there's an element of kind of vanity in it as well, of positioning this this you know middle aged body there, and um, and I've had you know when I've done a talk before, I had some questions which almost a critique about well if you're talking about this older body and all these other things, why does this body look so good and fit in the images? Why are you almost like pandering to the stereotype, you know? Um, and, and then actually, because it was, it was posted in a chat, and then as I went for the talk, then they said, ah, oh, I see, you're deliberately setting it up to break it down in a way, so that this sense of, oh, there is this masculine kind of muscular body, you know, I've got opinions or, or, you know, your immediate thoughts or what that would be in terms of perhaps desire or whatever, you know, whether it's hot or sexy or whatever. Um, and, and then I flounce around in a pink leather shade or something and try and disrupt that, you know, um, and, and those thoughts about what that would be. Um, and it wasn't necessarily, well, I was about to say it wasn't intentional, but, you know, during this project, I hired a personal trainer to <laughs> work that body. And that, that, you know, the vanity, the ego does come. If I'm going to be there photographing myself all the time, I kind of want to look nice for it, you know. Not that I'm, you know, fancy my own body, you know. I'm not attracted to myself. But it, it's like, how can I make myself more attractive to other people? Um, and... Um, uh, am I just living the gay dream and, and, and becoming the gay stereotype in terms of perpetuating as kind of a singular type of body that might be desirable? Um, but I think that, you know, I just think with my work, I kind of, it's, it's always breaking that down, um, you know, through just role play and, and playing and, and subverting what that position might be. And so then that position of that middle-aged body is, is Oh God, you know, whatever, creating some kind of stereotype to to try to, to dismantle that. And so that, you know, there is no particular middle-aged body. You know, it, it has to be fluid and it's got to be different for different people and mean different things to different people. Um, but the I think what I try and do with the work is set something up that might engage people and they might engage it on a or, or on a particular level and then maybe they start to think about oh what's that that's you know and and um and, and they might just start to challenge preconceived ideas or, or just think about what they're looking at in terms of the representation of the male body you know i mean the other side of it is it is it john copeland's of the photographer that photographed his kind of middle-aged body and and you know it was larger hairier and you know do this kind of squares of close-ups of that you know the body is kind of landscape and that was you know that was a kind of there's a traditional photographic technique to use the body as landscape you know treat it as an object but the object he was using was his middle-aged older hairy body you know and again it's you wouldn't is the idea that you wouldn't not normally find that as a subject in 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 most photography, in most art, but certainly something related to the male body. We don't tend to want to to show that, you know. Um, so I I'm I'm not sure about you know this thing about kind of the, the undetectable kind of showing that or where that disappears, but it was just opening up the possibilities of what the middle aged body is could be. You know, and, and that's what the project is, you know, it's going, what, what could it be in the future? Let's have a bit of fun. Let's think about all these different personas it could be. Well, I wonder if there is, just as a follow on question, I wonder if there is something about that, about those processes of biomedical surveillance of the undetectable body and, and you know, having your blood work every six months and having, you know, a, a, effectively an MOT every six months that, that changes that relationship to how you understand and monitor your own ageing body um, in ways that people who aren't POS might, might not quite experience. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, that, that's a really interesting point and occurred to me a number of times that actually I am on, under constant surveillance. You know, um, and um, you know it's it's you know it's it's what is it? It's checking for signs of ill health or checking for health. You know, it's 
um, but, but whether it's, you know, early signs. And I think, you know, you end up having obviously this, this intimate relationship with doctors and nurses and being in the clinic all the time to have these repetitive trips with blood tests and needles stuck in you and stuff. So you immediately have a kind of different relationship to that. And I think to um, a, a lot of other people would walk through life and not have that relationship. I think we're all aware about men not dealing with issues of health, whether it's physical health or mental health. And, you know, that, that I'm a man, therefore, you know, it's all those issues about, you know, you can't cry or whatever. It's the same about, you know, I don't want to bother the doctor. Being brave about stuff, it doesn't matter. Um, and what I have is a completely different relationship because I'm just under total scrutiny all the time. Um, and even the other day, you know, I got a message from the GP saying, oh, you, you're, you can have a, a health check, you know. And I like thought, well, I have them all the time. But it's like, yeah, I go down and I have, I have my, you know, my um finger pricked again you know and um uh yeah i had my weight measured and the rest of it you know and and i suppose it's it's to come so intrigual and in deep in integral to my life having all that go on and obviously this time it's saying when i got there they said well this the national health service is providing this and it's always now because you're a man of a certain age so you need to have your blood pressure done regularly you need to or well, what's what was that thing you know endoscope look for um prostate cancer you know the other day uh th there's all those kind of procedures because you're a man of a certain age and this one was to check your you know your your possibility of having stroke or a heart attack um and you know it's my head is just full of that my life is full of that it, it's all, all that kind of stuff doesn't leave me and again perhaps that's you know with richard's questions before there is a very intimate relationship to some of these medical procedures and technology and and tools and you know having a camera stuck up inside you it's like you know can't get more intimate than that I mean, prostate <laughs> massages are, are, are <laughs> you know are something one endorses they are healthy and it's good uh jose maybe one last question no? from uh, jose has had his his hand up for a while uh, thank you um, thank you very much for the images. I, I recognize a personal history and its social manifestations uh, in them. Uh, I, I, I wanted to, to, to ask about the trauma, really, because, mm -hmm. you know, I suppose I'm the same generation as you, and I suppose there's an initial trauma, <laughs> yeah, of, you know, what being diagnosed as HIV means. And then depending when you were diagnosed, there's another trauma which is actually realizing that you will live and that you now have to make a different life for yourself. I wonder if that was part of your experience and how it manifests itself in your work. Yeah. Um, the, Especially when, when you're now an older man, when that, you know, that second trauma comes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is doing great for me, just this whole talk reminding myself about how old I am. Um, but it's, it's, it's like you were saying about that that element about um you know when you were diagnosed and when it happened uh, you know because being diagnosed in 1994 before we had effective medication um that i remember walking down the street and i just go do the shopping and then it pop into my head you're gonna die soon you know, it, it, it was that kind of thing because everybody else was dying and that was the prognosis. And, you know, when I got my HIV diagnosis, it was like, well, you've got 10 years to live, so I'll be dead by the time I'm 40. Um, and that's at the outset. But if I carried on with my lifestyle, I'll be dead in five years. Um, you know, so, you know, you you were told that, you were faced with that. Um, and then then the medication came along and that transition to like, actually, you're not going to die. So that, that kind of element of trauma, you know, it goes back, I think, to that kind of time then and losing lots of friends and boyfriends and lovers and others, you know, um, to HIV, that, that that was happening. And 
there's to to I've and I've always honestly just said I'm so lucky you know and it goes back a little bit to what Peter was saying about the unmarked body and actually you know having all these veins and arteries was a way of marking myself it was like you know that you know that that the tattooing happened when I started in 2009 I'd been on the medication for four years I was undetectable by that point and I think there was something in me that says I have to mark this um, because it's invisible to people. People don't know w- w- what my life has been like or what I've gone through, but it's, it's not for other people, it's for myself. But it was, this was me marking myself. And, and maybe at that point it was, a, and that's why I was saying I tried to stop doing work around HIV and AIDS and move on to other stuff. Because I say, well, look, I'm undetectable now. I've got a normal life expectancy. I can move on and do other things. But having the tattoos were just this constant reminder to me about, you know, that that's where I've come from and that's what's, you know, where I where I am. Um, and so then it, it's I, I've left this constant marker on my body to to carry forward. But I'm reminded every morning when I take the pills. You know, uh, again, I have to take the pills. I cannot um, forget about it. Um, uh, and so I don't know. There's it, 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 however much older I'm getting, and and like saying that's that really starts to inform the work now. Thinking about well, what are the next steps? You know, what's the next chapter in my life? You know, that I'm only fifty-eight. You know, my grandmother was one hundred and one before she died. My parents are both alive, and they're in their late eighties. So, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, you know, another 30 years or whatever, or 40. So what am I going to do in those next 30 to 40 years? You know, that's another entire lifetime. And it's a lifetime to be as outrageous as one wants to be. It's a lifetime to be the most dandy daddy ever, you know. Um, and it's, it's going to be a life where... I take everything I learned from the 80s and apply it to the rest of my life. Um, you know, I'm still going to go out clubbing and I'm going to dress up and I'm going to have fun. Um, that's, that's how it's, it's impacted. Thank you very much. Well, did you have you said that was the last question, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yes. <laughs> it's half past already. God. It is. Yes. Yeah, it's close. Uh, thank you so much, Richard. That well, was I really. That's been enjoyable. <laughs> that was really enjoyable, and it was really nice to hear you just kind of chat and reminisce about uh, your life and 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 your work. Uh, Nice chat. I mean, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, yeah, everyone. Well, uh, thank you, for, thank you, and Peter, but all, thank you very all much. everybody else for all those those really interesting questions. That, I mean, again, now my head is busting all these different thoughts and possibilities and stuff. Well, something to think about now in the, the next, you know, fifty years <laughs> <laughs> of your life. Uh, well, thank you so much. There's another session, I believe, at four, so we have about half an hour for a break. And yeah, thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. And thank you. See you soon. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody.